hello everybody and welcome to the talk Ecology Without Moralism, the first session of a series of research events held at London Met called Finding Ecologies. I'm Rosemary McGoldrick, I'm an Associate Teaching Professor here at London Met and course leader of the MFA in Fine Art. Since 2008, I have organised a series of conference symposiums called the Animal Gaze. 2008, the Animal Gaze. 2011, uh, the Animal Gaze returned. And 2020, the Animal Gaze constructed. So we have a, we have a solid body of animal-human studies already being held at the, at the London Met. Um, I'm chair I will be sh chairing this uh, session today with Trevor Norris. Trevor Norris is the course leader of the BA Creative Writing and English Literature, and we will hear from Trevor shortly. Um, we will be sort of asking people to get involved with what we're doing. We want to get as much feedback from the audience as possible, um, and uh, we want to make this an enjoyable series of events and an enjoyable morning. So thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I would just like to point out, of course, you know, the eco-critical at this particular time is exactly on point what we're doing today. Questions have recently come to the fore about collaboration, about growth in the off-grid, and about the flight from um, hierarchy, um, about political uh, antagonisms, uh, new alliances, and the utility of op op oppositional stances, as well as David Hume's old philosophy, uh, philosophical binary of, out, of alt versus is. Um, there also applies, this also applies to our talk, Ecology Without Moralism today. And with, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our participants, who is Alice Shires, who joins us now from Australia, is the director of the University of Technology in Sydney, of the Psychology Clinic, Andrew Patrizio is the Programme Director in History of Art at Edinburgh College of Art. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name's Trevor Norris. As Rosie says, I'm the course leader for Creative Writing and uh, English Literature uh, at London Met. And we're starting a uh, discussion, um, and this is the first event for our Finding Ecologies Research Initiative, with a, a session that's called Ecology Without Moralism. Um, this takes a, a, a nod from Tim Morton's uh, Ecology Without Nature, and we may have a chance to talk about some of Tim Morton's ideas uh, later on. But um, I just want to start off by making uh, a case for the connection between modes of feeling um, and ecological uh, decline. We know that um, so much political debate um, is, is very oppositional, uh, antagonistic, full of uh, angry moralism uh, and accusations uh, of harm. Uh, and what I would like us to think about this morning is, is the way in which these ecologies of emotion might be related to the broader structures of, of ecological harm that we're all uh, trying to undo. So there's a question that underlies this morning's session, and we'll have a second uh, meeting before we um, end for the summer recess on Monday, June the 21st uh, from 6 to 7 p.m. And at the end of this morning's session, I'll say a little bit about uh, what, that, uh, what that will in, uh, involve. But the same kind of question underlies this morning's session and the session in June, uh, and it's this, and I suppose I might uh, put that usefully into the chat in, in a bit. What's the simplest biotechnology with the greatest potential for the greatest reach in, in terms of practicability, public funding, economies of scale and so on that can resensitize people to the way that they cease to flourish in relation to themselves, to others and to their worlds. And I'm using the term biotechnology very broadly here um, to involve, uh, to, to mean anything that we might do uh, with our bodies in the ecology, you know, this is the, the emotional bodily ecology in which we find ourselves that also involves a kind of skill, uh, a techniques that we can roll out and apply. Because if we're going to change uh, the way that we behave, it's got to be something that is within our reach. And, and very often when it comes to questions of ecological change, we start with this enormous picture of catastrophic environmental decline. And that can often lead to feelings of uh, inertia, that the problem is so great that we can't do anything. Uh, about it. So really I'd like us to reverse that this morning through our discussion. 
what is it that we can do that can bring about flourishing? If we think that the general problem that we're trying to address is lack of flourishing in this macro environmental scale, how does that lack of flourishing relate to the lack of flourishing that we might feel in our ordinary everyday lives? And again, what's the simplest biotechnology in our ordinary everyday lives that we can use to try to create the conditions for flourishing? My role here uh, and in the next session as well is a, as an interested inquirer into other disciplines. So uh, Alice, our first guest who's going to speak is a clinical psychologist, and this is not my field. Um, and, but in a sense, I think that's quite useful because another helpful biotechnology is clear communication. Um, and so ideally what will happen is that the conversation that we have today will be something that you can take out and, uh, and start with other people. Uh, and we can grow these ideas uh, about uh, flourishing in this um, uh, uh, in this way. So um, let me say something uh, about moralism. Um, we're very often used to thinking about ecological change um, with a series of injunctions about what we must not do. So we have to stop flying, we have to stop buying things we don't need, we have to stop eating meat, uh, and so on. And these are moralistic injunctions. If you don't do that in some way, you're a failure. Um, and the broader picture also is of disastrous uh, environmental decline. So a, a strong case is made in a lot of appeals for change between the moral deficiencies that we might have uh, as individuals, the things that we're um, uh, doing that we should not be doing, and a connection to broader structures uh, of uh, environmental decline. So I'm interested in thinking about what we feel, why we feel it, how we feel it, um, and asking how these patterns of feelings are plugged into those broader structures uh, of object distribution systems, planes, uh, plastics, petrochemicals circling about in the environment. When we feel moved to judgment about ecological harm, uh, how do we begin our inquiry? We often begin by speaking from anxious feelings of being out of control. And we compensate for these by trying to find this top order perspective, a fully sewn up, fully defended theoretical and political take. And this is also something that can lead to moralism. You know, someone who doesn't agree with us, who doesn't hold the same principles, the same theoretical understanding, that can lead to this impulse to diminish, to critique, to expel and shame the people who aren't worthy uh, of our attention, time and care. So part of the first um, discussions in the Finding Ecologies research group is to explore emotional ecologies as a means of regrowth and avoiding shame. I want to say one more thing before I ask Alice to start to speak. Um, I'm really interested in a space for meaningful action that avoids respectability, respectability politics, quietism and moralism. And my intention out of these discussions is to explore how we can create and hold space for resilient and assertive action that doesn't deplete people because it trades in humiliation and shame. We know that shame structures don't lead people to transformed actions. And so this morning, what I'm going to ask Alice to speak about first is how we can understand the relationship between shame and inaction and how we can find a path of action towards flourishing. So these are all foundational questions for our inquiries. Um, uh, and I'm going to start by asking Alice um, a question, um, which is, why aren't we flourishing in the way we live now? What are the complexes of poor mental health that we might think of as part of the uh, emotional ecologies in which we live? Wow, that's a huge question, Trevor, but thanks. I'll, it's a good opening uh, uh, question. So I'm speaking as a clinical psychologist and uh, I'm going to talk a bit from my experience and I'm also going to talk from my uh, location, which is Australia. And I do want to begin with acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. And this is the, the tradition, they are the traditional custodians of the land around Sydney, which is where I'm meeting you from today. And I want to pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past and present. 
and uh, I think this I'll come back to that introduction it's one that we use in Australia and it's one that acknowledges connection connection between ourselves and uh, the Aboriginal nations that go before us and their connection with land and their connection with kinship and it brings me into the 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 issue of connection and I'm sure that I'm going to repeat that many times I think connection and sensitizing or resensitizing are the two uh, central themes to the bigger question of flourishing but in my view and 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 this is as a psychologist but also my personal opinion I think that what we're seeing uh, currently across the world uh, is the usual problems of anxiety, depression, anger, you know, you name it, the let's call them the, the, the destructive emotions. But really because they were so amplified by us being at what we I see as the kind of pointy end of capitalism, of consumerism, competition, control technology. Someone referred to it recently in a book, junk values, not junk food, but junk values that we that we're we're using to try and mend ourselves when they become the problem. And so we're certainly seeing both the cumulative effects of trauma, disconnection, with this amplification of circumstances around uh, a sense of disconnection with our land, our nature, our animals, our values, uh, ourselves, in fact, uh, we're, we're disconnected from the way that we feel. And uh, young people have been so affected more recently, too, in terms of being disconnected from their plans and hopes and aspirations. And, and, and they have a dread of uncertainty in what the future may bring. So some of the solutions to these distresses also become the problems. In fact, most problems are a, an attempt at a solution of misuse of drugs, alcohol, kind of hoarding the greedy response that we have at trying to keep, get more for ourselves to feel more uncertain about the future or avoiding uh, just hiding, giving up, uh, 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 avoiding the distress, all of which just lead to more loneliness, isolation, all of the problems that we're seeing. So I think there are some tremendous hurdles to uh, manage and cope with what what are emo it's not that emotions and are the problem it's that there are difficulty in managing them and getting back to a kind of default position really of a more constructive emotions of cooperation empathy community connection both with community but also with ourselves so uh, i've certainly got some ideas about how that might be done and and to me biotechnology is not such a, 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 I'm not so keen on the phrase because it makes it sound very very much tied up with a kind of technology futuristic thinking when in my mind as I'll explain I believe that the answers are already with us and have come from a very long distant past rather than needing to find new answers the answers have been there all the time and are certainly becoming uh, really taken on by psychological therapies and taken on by the psycho the psychology community uh, in, in ways that I think are going to be very essential to flourishing. Thank you, Alice. <clears throat> um, so you've mentioned a couple of the problems and the typical problems that people uh, experience and um, you mentioned uh, trauma uh, and PTSD. Um, and we could uh, add to that structures of bullying and social scapegoating, various different social groups that are uh, excluded or made the scapegoat uh, of social ills. Um, when we take all of these harmful structures together um, and, and we think about the way in which they are symptoms uh, of not flourishing, we might ask a question of psychology, um, which is how can we understand the structures of the mind? that lead to these conditions. And we can see that these are harmful symptomatologies, we recognize them in ourselves and all uh, around us. But what's actually going on in the mind? Um, what cognitive structures in the mind do we need to understand to help us think through these uh, problems? Yeah, 
It's a good question because I and and I think before I start sort of talking a bit about the mind, um, there's uh, there's been a tremendous um, tendency in psychology to kind of blame the individual for their own pathology and their own problems, uh, rather than consider the societal, the political, the greater, the the the, the great, you know, the, the 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 problems in the in society. But having said that, of course, we perceive our society through our eyes and ears and and uh, and that and we pr and we, we we make sense of that in our minds so minds are important and uh, my research in in mindfulness really brought me to start to sort of uh, you know be very interested in the elements of the mind that have uh, a role in amplifying or misinterpreting or interpreting in negative ways with a negative bias some of the the things that are going on outside so there's the wider political social but within you know we need to also understand how the mind sort of understands and makes sense of what comes in and one of the one of the uh, areas of the brain was and this is thanks to technology that we can now see not just localized parts of the brain as was the case we'd have a little bit here for this and a bit for this now we see that there are these networks of across the brain uh, that have responsibilities across all areas of the brain and they're really beautiful to see when you see them on a brain scan but the biggest one, or one of the central ones, is the default network. And it's called the default network because it's the way that the mind gets activated when we're at rest, when we're not engaged in purposeful activity. And it has a great function, which is that it assists us to daydream and think and, 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 and kind of imagine and all sorts of things. But it also, when it's overactive or when we get stuck with it, it's responsible for worry, rumination and all sorts of, of really you know simply analyze a lot of the problems that we have in terms of the anxieties and depression and so on it's referred to as the me network because it's the network in the brain that's responsible for deciding whether input is it, how relevant it is to the self so self-referential thinking so when information comes in we need to know how what does that mean to me uh but of course we can see in people who struggle and perhaps as a society is in general that that we see there's a lot of me thinking you know and that when the default network is shut down <laughs> we're able to inhibit it when we go into when we, if, what a state of flow when we're doing meaningful activity then we're not in me mode we're actually in a much more uh enjoyable mode that doesn't involve the thinking about me so although we need to think about me it's it's actually doesn't bring uh, well-being with it there's also a salience network that tells us which things are important to focus our attention on and that connects with this the, the, the default network to get us thinking about things but it relies on messages from the body it re it relies on interceptive awareness to decide what's salient the body tells us what's is salient and the default network interprets what that means so this is mind body and it's really been this this inc this wonderful research into the neurology of things that's in enabled us to go back to the mind body connection which we lost in psychology we spent you know a lot of time just being in the head uh, and not connecting with the body so when you said resensitize I'm very interested in the the phenomena of interoception, the ability to read the body, the signals from the body that that tell the brain that there's an emotion. So we don't have an emotion and then operate on the body. The body tells the brain that we have an emotion. So it senses body states, and then those are those are are uh, experienced as an emotion and then reacted to, depending on what those other parts of the networks. Uh, do now when those networks and, and all of those components are what we need but if they're in balance we have good mental health but increasingly what we're seeing is that they're not in balance that people can't feel the body their their interceptive levels are low 
that that correlates with disorders like depression, anxiety, and the default network is highly activated in thought, thought that's self-referential, and that and that these systems are really kind of out of whack, basically. Uh, and of course, my bias is towards mindfulness as a as a one of the ways in which we can um, assist, really, to uh, ameliorate these findings that depleted interception and inflated self-referential cognition or rumination is present across mental disorders. So, uh, so interception and the, and achieving balance in these components within the mind is what I'm interested in. And of course, what I'll come to if I if I get a chance later is that these are very much components of a Buddhist psychology. The Buddhists knew these were the components of understanding. They didn't call them those things. They hadn't got brain scans. But these are very familiar concepts and understandings. And there's a technology uh, that goes with it that enables us to uh, improve and or create different mental states, better, more harmonious, more balanced. Uh, uh, then I'll talk a little bit more about those as, as we go on. That's wonderful, Alice. Um, thank you so much. And just to before we hand over to uh, Rosie and Andrew, just to, to tie this together that, uh, um, with the theme, we're thinking about ecology without moralism. And, and clearly, if the it, it seems that if the default mode network is, is overactive, then we're in this intense state of, of moral evaluation, of judgment, of storytelling, of rumination, of fixing ourselves in, in value judgments about whether other people are bad, whether we're bad, whether they're good, whether we're good. We, we become very rigidly stuck in patterns uh, of moralistic evaluation and, and we become, in a sense, autobiographically uh, fixed. Um, a little later on, I would really like you to talk um, about your understanding of interreception, because we're thinking, we've, we've just thought about how we are not flourishing, how in our emotional bodily um, uh, in ecologies, we may not be flourishing because of these um, rigid structures in our mind. And after uh, Andrew and Rosie have spoken, perhaps we can come back and, and you can tell us a little bit more about how we might start to flourish and how your research into Indeed. interreception can lead us towards uh, a simple bio Indeed, absolutely yeah okay um what i'm going to do is just hand over to andrew now and we're going to have a discussion later on after andrew's actually presented um, um so andrew have you got your um, camera working i have yeah hopefully can you see me yeah, you look lovely. Thank you very much, as do you, even though you've gone. Lovely to see you, Rosie, and, and hi, everyone. And uh, lovely to meet you too, Trevor and Alice. Looking forward to having a wider chat, you know, before we before we wrap up. Um, yeah, so, so what I was going to do is I was going to give a little sort of very thumbnail sketch of, of some of the ideas I was working with in The Ecological Eye, which is a book I published now a couple of years ago. Um, that I had the chance to speak to at Rose's great conference um, in March last year, uh, the Animal Gaze Constructed, um, just before lockdown was happening and kind of the, the pandemic was sort of hovering as a shadow over the conference. Um, and I came down from, from Scotland and, and then disappeared back up to, to, uh, to Scotland as soon as it finished. It seems like a really kind of an era ago that that happened. Um, so yeah there's lots of thoughts that have changed i guess about the book um although it was an intense period of about five years of writing it um some bits most of it i'm really proud of and you know it was a real struggle to to do um in another sense there's bits and uh, of, of it that i think would feel needing to be looked at again and, and changed um in the light of what what uh, has happened since um so it, it's a 70,000 <clears> excuse me word monograph about art history about contemporary art history being an art historian working with the visual now but looking back through um, the traditions of, of quite a traditionally elitist discipline and trying to plot a path through some of the best of that 
older art history and reimagine it in new ways and, and bring it into dialogue with a lot of external um, dialogues and traditions to do with um, post-colonial thinking, to do with anarchism, to do with critical animal studies, critical plant studies, um, environmental justice and the like. <clears throat> and it used the three ecologies of um, Felix Guattari in his th book, Three Ecologies, um, as, as a practicing um, psychoanalyst. He's maybe a useful link here to some of the more neuroscientific um, ideas that um, Alice has been mentioning. But the three ecologies of Guattari are, are very, are very um, compelling, that there's an environmental ecology, there's an interpersonal social ecology, and there's a mental ecology. And even if you accept the 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 kind of the um, formulaic notion of those three ecologies there's a lot of interconnectedness and overlapping across those ecologies so we mustn't think of ecology in in art history for example as simply nature or simply landscape um, the mental ecology the political ecology and the interpersonal social ecology um, uh, play out in our discipline as much as any other discipline now Trevor talked and reading some of his prompts um uh, this this strong notion of flourishing i uh, started to sort of think about in terms of the book and of course one of the paradoxes here to throw in is that the ecological eye the reason why it was written um was me as a as a curator you know who moved into art history uh, sort of mid-career um the, the prompt behind the ecological eye was to try to make art historians feel worse i think that's kind of quite an important thing to to underline. I wanted the discipline and those working in the discipline, particularly those who'd worked in relatively traditional, you know, ways that had dealt with so much of the old fashioned, self-absorbed, rather elitist structures of that discipline, which is not the whole discipline, of course, but it is still a persistent element of it. I wanted them to feel worse. And maybe I'm gonna throw out a word here, which I didn't use in the book, but I've used in other contexts since, which is the word of embarrassment. You know, I wanted to prompt a kind of professional embarrassment that our discipline, not alone, but our discipline amongst many others, had ignored ecological climate crisis imperative um, injustices globally. Um, and the notion of the kind of monkish endeavor within a university was a form of hiding and re retreat that was no longer possible okay so there was this re real sense of trying to embarrass the discipline and make some sense of self-criticality come to play now i want to say a couple of things about that um, and the obvious one would be there are plenty of art historians that got that way ahead of me and that realized how important that that challenge was and were already meeting it i think i think also younger generations um appreciated this more than maybe people, <clears throat> excuse me, of my generation. So not only did I publish the book, um, and I've done various writings around the book, um, I also teach a course, sort of fourth year undergraduate, in Scotland we have four years of course, um, undergraduate called Radical Nature, and it's always oversubscribed, it always attracts brilliant students, and I get more from the students than I give to them, um, and, but what I really notice is that it changes their way of thinking, not just about their own discipline of doing art history, but what they then go off and do, you know, when they graduate. And I'm in touch with a number of them in this, this lovely conversation of transformation that they've experienced, <clears throat> at least in part, through doing the course, makes me more confident that younger generations of, of, um, of thinkers, activists, people generally um, uh, are going to take many of these battles forward um, and whether or not I, I persuade or encourage maybe is a better term um, people who are rather more set in their ways to do with uh, sort of disciplinary competence um, is is you know maybe more of a challenge so another thing I think I wanted to kind of um, uh, sort of throw in here I mean I don't want to say talk about 
too much to do with the, the, the book itself. The first chapter, I think, is actually available through Manchester University Press. So if people want to explore it more, I think you can get free access to the to the copy uh, to the, of the first opening chapter. And I think those of you in universities can get it, can download the whole thing. So there's a couple of thoughts here that I would just sort of quickly um, throw out. Uh, one would be that my sense is that you encourage change through what Marsha Miskimmon, a feminist art historian, calls affirmative criticality. And I take by what Marsha means is um, you inspire through positive modeling. Um, you, you, whilst you use sort of deconstructive alienation, anger, anti-capitalist, anti-nihilist kind of fuel perhaps, um, you're gonna struggle to inspire change through, through constant anger, constant negative critique. And I think a lot of my colleagues, I do see this as a very persistent mode that they can't escape from. So I, I kind of imagined the ecological eye as a kind of virtue signaling for a, a more positive way to think about doing art history. Um, so I think I throw out that idea of, of, of um, to change towards the positive is a much easier thing than to um, disaffirm the negative. And that maybe is, is where embarrassment fits in as quite a nice tool to kind of shift your, your own practices. Um, and another thing I wanted to say here, and I'm mean, taking up Trevor, for me, I pick up Trevor's work and his propositions to do around affect, to do with personal growth, um, but also contradictorily degrowth models, models of de uh, pulling back, um, and also this non-hierarchy. Um, Rosie talked about it too, and it's a key part of my book, is, is looking at non-hierarchical models as a way of radically redistributing how something like justice works, how something like paying attention um, works. And the idea of paying attention, attentiveness, um, Alice, you might think of this in terms of mindfulness, art historians would say, oh, we're incredibly attentive. We, you know, we, we, we pour over objects of value um, in it to excruciating detail. But what one pays attention to, I think, is a live debate now still within, within art history. Um, one other maybe introductory point, and then I'll kind of stop and Rosie and I can um, um, throw about some ideas. One, one, one other thing which I think is um, important in my own thinking since The Ecological Eye was published is um, how it, it's a non-binary book, obviously. It's, it's about refusing binary oppositions. But a number of those kind of binary oppositions do persist. I mean, growth and degrowth might be an obvious one. But also, I'm thinking of um, writings about decolonization not being metaphorical. So decolonization is a fantastic um, area. And current and active and not properly pro properly addressed, I don't think, in, in the book, although I think the broader frames of reference and lines of inquiry are in the book, but there's definitely a, an element missing there. But de decolonization is not a metaphor. You know, that notion of we can't metaphorize everything. And, uh, and I think, although I could list a number of other examples of this, I think in in my discipline, there is a constant tension between something like, say, um, political action versus um, quietism or removal or attentiveness or thoughtfulness. OK, so that, that would be one. So political action. I have a lot of students who are very politically active and they resist notions of slowing down, paying attention, particularly paying attention to art objects. So there's a there's a tension there, and there's a, a tension between. Well, I'll mention one other uh, one, which would be to do with interconnectedness. Um, Trevor mentions Timothy Morton, but of course Jane Bennett, the, the whole new materialist movement, speculative realism, talks about a radically expanded um, version of, um, you know, a, a, a non-hierarchical. Uh, um, attention and interconnectedness, relationality. But there's a, a, a philosopher called Frederick Neyrat who wrote a chapter in a book called General Ecology, 
by a, a writer called Eric Hall. And they've spoken at Documenta and they've spoken at Serpentine. So they're kind of philosophers, but they're speaking into sort of art structures. Um, and um, Frederick Neyrat wrote a very provocative chapter, I thought, on the ecology of separation. And this got me thinking about this mantra we all speak of in ecology, ecological thinking and eco-critical thinking about connectedness. But in actual fact, one can't operate a notion of expanded connectedness unless one has a, a very attentive thought about difference, about separation. Because there is an anxiety, I'll finish on this, there is an anxiety that can be easily induced by over-attentiveness, by over-openness. And I think that that is where I think, I leave that as an as a, as a ongoing thought I have, but um, connectedness as a, as a model is only one side of this important thing that we call kind of eco-critical inquiry. Okay, maybe that's enough to, to get, get us going. Thank you, Andrew. It was really interesting sort of going back and looking through your book again, and also sort of the, the how it requires attention as well as the, the, the information that you give to us that we can pick up quite easily. It was great sort of going through and again looking at um, Val Plumwood, Plumwood's work, who's just an inspirational, wonderful woman, and just looking yes. at her sort of uh, her feminism and the mastery of nature and reading about her crocodile sort of um, survival. But um, I was just thinking, um, uh, uh, Andrew, when I did the first animal gaze in 2008, um, what usually happened at symposiums and, and conferences is that the academics, the art historians, the critical writers would speak, not the artists. So what I made a conscious decision was that, you know, people like Marcus Coates, um, Joe Longhurst and all the artists who were there in the exhibition because we insisted there had to be an exhibition with the, with the symposium that they spoke on the panel and it was completely new. I remember David Wood, the philosopher David Wood sort of turned around and said, well this is trailblazing this isn't what happens um, in normal symposiums. The artists have kept somewhere else and, and also just reading as well the review by uh, you know, Art of the Anthropocene. I know sort of you're talking about, is it T.J. Dimos, where he's discrediting that? Well, within that book, um, you've got Lucy Lippard reviewing it, saying, well, actually, artists are now being involved. They're not standing on the sidelines. They are actively being involved in this idea of the Anthropocene, of how you sustain your practice in a collaborative, non-hierarchical way. And I think that's really exciting. I think lots of artists are excited. And also you get this sense, this is why the Tate and the Turner Prize now has five collaborative groups um, rather than one individual artist winning the Turner Prize. So there's very interesting things going on. And I'm really um, sort of interested in how you talk about hierarchy and collaborativeness um, instead of the great one art historian thinker giving, you're talking about, as you were saying, objects and things and how that works in the world today, um, which is, uh, you know, I, 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 and I totally agree with your idea that, you know, of positivism, um, that the, the art history, which you kind of think is quite, sort of, you know, it does have that kind of, it's not critical theory, it's art history. And I really like that you're taking that stance and saying, you know, we will change this, we will look at this and how it works. So it's really interesting your hierarchy. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks, Rosie. I mean, um, there's a there are a lot of I think art historians, and and they when I say art historians, that that expands itself to visual cultural thinkers, to curators, um, to people who work in 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 expanded forms of of art history. But whilst I'll always um, caricature and laugh at and seek to embarrass the worst examples of my discipline you know the fact is there's lots of very politically engaged and exciting work going on here and and a number of of, of my colleagues collaborate closely with artists and learn from artists now sometimes those artists are alive and there are ones that they can be in dialogue with and i think you can also be in dialogue with artists who are not alive and not from your culture and and can teach you a lot from from centuries and uh territories that are far away um the, the the book and I won't go on about the book. The book didn't talk about individual practices, and uh, 
because I I've always written I trained you know partly as an artist I've always collaborated with artists all the time I felt I could step back for this one project and not just try to nail ecological thinking on individual artists so what excites me a lot is how one might find the ecological and eco-critical thinking not in works that are so obviously about nature so whilst i you know i'm very engaged with practices that are dealing with plastics or dealing with deep time um and 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 artists have well been ahead of of art historians in that you know so i'm very confident that that our practice has got far more to say than art history but i love the fact that you could look at different art forms that are not obviously you know about nature um and and view them and and listen to them as as ecological contributions so, can i come in at this point because this is i think a really important point when we tend to think about ecology the way that it's been set up in the ecological humanities is to think about that green stuff that is over there and you know the term that i well you know if ecology means anything it means uh, the environment in which we are um uh, you know the oikos the, the the dwelling space and the way that we kind of speak uh, about that and to kind of you know, um, bring it into uh, connection. I want to um, bring uh, Andrew's point and, and, and Alice together. Um, and uh, Andrew, it was very interesting that, that you were talking about the angry and anxious moralism um, that can be part of uh, ecological activism. And we know this, and again, that comes back to that first point about being impelled to action because it is ethically urgent and there's a disaster uh, which is impending. That, that, and I want to ask Alice to, to, to come back to that point in, in relation to these structures of, of danger, risk, salience, harm, an overly active moral evaluation that's part of the default network. All those things seem to be about separation. When we're concentrating on structures of judgment, when we want to make those clear separations between good and bad, and when we spend all our time focusing on what's coming towards us that's going to harm us, all those are structures of separation. Uh, Andrew talked about a kind of emotional degrowth, and I think this is really key uh, as well, um, paying attention to connectedness. And this seemed to me to be the point to ask Alice to talk about interreception again. In a sense, interreception and practices of, of mindfulness are about an emotional degrowth. They're about moving away from that hyper productivity uh, of judgment uh, and moralism into a more mindful attention to structures of connectedness between oneself uh, and the environment so you know if we can if we can think about how understanding interreception and mindfulness might be a basic biotechnology of flourishing i think that would bring uh, the two things together in an interesting way yeah well i i i certainly think that the in a way you know therapies have been like society they've been focused on sort of efficiency and uh, models of kind of uh, you know reprocessing thoughts they're, they're you know mechanical kind of models for human well-being uh, you know that we can change thoughts that we can you know make things fast get people well quicker even treat people so they can go back to war you know uh, uh, you know, cure PTSD so they can go on to do more harm. And so, you know, those all feel to me as though they may be uh, going forward in this kind of, um, the, the kind of unhelpful way. And that actually to go backwards in, in some ways is the way. And most cultures have either traditional or um, uh, ancient really forms of introspective and um, kind of more spiritual ways of dealing with human distress that have been that aren't religious they've been considered as religious and been put in kind of religious dogma baskets whereas in fact lots of those wisdoms certainly in australia for example the indigenous people talk have a uh, what's called didere deep listening paying attention fully linking with the land linking with kinship this is a sort of uh, you know that's very much about well-being and connection and attention all of those things but not about you know making quick change to cure people so they can get back out into you know their their factory job kind of thing 
And so there are ancient wisdoms. And of course, I, you know, I'm coming from a, a more Buddhist perspective because mindfulness training um, and certainly the way that I am researching and, and, and teaching, it comes from that more contemplative, introspective traditions. So it is the monks, but hiding and retreating, but th not seeing that necessarily as, a, as, as going backwards, but actually going backwards in order to go forwards. And that interceptive uh, awareness, the ability to become aware of the body, becomes the guide to things like ethics, not dogma and not moralism, but personal ethics. You can feel when something isn't right. If we lost, we've lost the skill to feel and make decisions based on this, this body that tells us how we feel about things. We've become more reliant on dogma. We've become more reliant on morals. And of course, as I said before, this default network and all this self-referential thinking is very good at that. And so to be able to feel, to be able to use the body, to be able to manage those emotions, because uh, mindfulness training actually consists of training in uh, interoceptive awareness, but partly for the pur purpose of developing equanimity, uh, being able to not react, being able to respond in more helpful ways and uncover what I think is really the default position in, in, of humans is, is one of compassion, of, of one of cooperation, of uh, some very much more positive emotional states that are hidden under this kind of layer of morality, dogma, self-judgment, judgment of others, and all of the reactions that go with those, the panicked reactions, the ways that are, are, are unhelpful. So contemplative, whether it's contemplative on, you know, the, the body and the mind, but also contemplative on our environment, whether that's nature, whether that's art, to slow down, to be, if we were all a bit more monkish, <laughs> it might not be a bad thing um, to balance, to achieve balance. And it's interesting, you know, in Buddhist um, uh, uh, literature, they talk about a whole array of positive emotions, not just as we do happiness, this kind of uh, sensory, you know, pleasure through happiness, but things like compassion, things like uh, uh, gratitude, contentment, sympathetic joy, these rich repertoires of emotions felt, embodied, uh, and and enjoy and 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 enjoyed and shared that make connections. So connection between people, connection between people and land, uh, and connection between mind and body. Uh, and and that takes work. I think that takes contemplation, slowing down, uh, practicing techniques that are that are, that take a long time. They can't be done immediately like an antidepressant that was marketed as be allowing you to be more in the moment. You know, these are these technologies that sort of expect instant results. It's actually going for going back uh, will will be of assistance to us. That, that in my in my view, I, I know that there's I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we are yeah, coming close. So thank, um, coming close um, to uh, eleven o'clock, and there are some questions that have come into um, the chat. And I want to um, just say very briefly, what we're talking about is not a, a space for quietism. It's not a space for respectability uh, at all. It's a, how can we dial down this emotional overproduction so that we can move into a space for progressive change? And I want to therefore turn to a question from. Um, uh, Andrea, and it's a question to, to Andrea in the panel. How does the, the, the populace begin turning towards paying attention to things and ideas that they may be ignorant of or with respect to having the right dosage of anger or naming injustice? What's the right dosage uh, of uh, anger? And maybe uh, Andrea and I want to respond to that. Andrea, could you answer that? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a good question, Andrew. It's a subtle question, I think, um, and, I, and I don't have the answer. Um, I'd like to believe that, um, well, there's the, okay, there's the problem around the populace and the we and me saying something that might work for me but might not work for somebody else. So I have colleagues who need massive doses of anger and it drives fantastic work by them that would be self-destructive to me. So I'm, I'm mindful of, of, um, 
you know, not generalizing here. And I think I was also, I was also going to ask Alice about this notion of, I know, I know we want to get to questions, but also the notion of in, in Australia, you're going to be more attentive to um, indigenous um, perspectives from Australian early cultures. Um, Buddhism as an Indian, um, something that comes from India, it's very powerful in the West, but there are other indigenous knowledges out there um, and I think that can also be a form of anxiety and overwhelmingness. I'm very sympathetic to, um, you know, Edward Cohn's How Forests Think, Ecuadorian forest thought. I have no connection with that, you know, from my own knowledge base, but it seems fascinating. It seems very powerful. So anger meeting openness to very diverse indigenous traditions is, I think, endemic, you know, so I'm going to stop there, but it's, it's a big, it's a big challenge. I don't know if Alice, if you want to. Um, well, uh, I, guess, um, I mean, anger is really interesting. I could talk a lot about it, but uh, uh, I guess it's whether or not it's harmful uh, and if it's harmful to the self or others. So from a Buddhist perspective or a more mindfulness perspective, uh, then then to be aware of the sensations that are involved in mindfulness, one just needs to be aware so that you can then make a response as to what would be most helpful to myself but also to others that might be to take action that might be to protest it may be to uh it, you know to 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 fight it, you know but it but it's through a it's through a wisdom rather than a reaction and that's the core difference so and if, if we develop more self-awareness we can probably be more aware of those subtle sensations as emotions start to emerge and be a bit wiser about what we do with them so that we're responding not through dogma, not through guilt, not through reaction, not from fear, but from a kind of wisdom base. Uh, so that I guess that's the way I'd look at it. And, and just to come in and, and to pick up a question from um, TCT uh, in the chat, who says, do you think it's possible or productive to be mindful and non-moralist about major players in climate break breakdowns, such as industrial oil and meat producers? Some level of blame seems appropriate in such uh, scenarios. And again, for me, it's absolutely clear that what we're talking about is not a space for quietism. It's not a space about turning inwards uh, and relieving ourselves um, of our emotional distress. It's rather about trying to deal with the kind of emotional burnout that already exists before people jump into the fray. And I think that in, in a sense, this is what Alice's research can sort of tell us uh, about. I think many people who are uh, interested in activism are fired by a powerful sense of injustice. There is a powerful moral evaluation about what is wrong, but that can often be a sign, as Alice has suggested, of, of being stuck in this very rigid structure of moral evaluation and judgment. And that itself can be a sign of emotional burnout. So we're not talking about not being angry uh, at all. We're talking about how can we get in touch with the way in which we might be burnt out before we start running towards the burning building. Um, if we use up all our energy, I mean, it's in, in a sense, you know, what, what activism understands, you, you can't use up all your energy straight away. And if you're already burnt out before you start, then you're not going to be able to keep going for the length of time that it is required as we deal with all these extractivist disasters that the that, that tct is is pointing out uh, mina uh, makes mina, yeah go on andrew yeah. sorry just quickly a tct's question there is um i've got a lot of friends who work in you know environmental organizations and some of them say that the oil and meat producers don't necessarily want that there's not that there's a willingness to produce oil and meat there's a willingness to make shed loads of money and th I think the veganism movement uh, can we can learn a lot from that we can actually learn a lot from sort of civil rights and and black feminism I was listening to Angela Davis last night give a talk to it in a to Edinburgh audience and that inspirational you know positive framing of something elsewhere was so moving and so inspiring and it was and I think in veganism you're seeing young people having conversations on, on a local level and companies at a high level moving fast now they're not moving for any greater reasons than why they would do meat packing in the 19th century but but the move is 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 glorious and and obviously welcome and necessary so i think that idea of putting something out there that is a positive um alternative 
means you don't have to keep attacking meat producers, oil companies, you just do something else. And things can change in that sense. And I've, in COVID and pandemic has shown a number of different ways where that has actually operated quite fast on a very local distributed level. Andrew, just sort of, I, I totally agree with you. And, uh, you know, someone like Angela Davis, who was very important when I was a young woman, sort of, uh, but also sort of, uh, you know, these women who've been sort of displaced for a long time, and now the, you know, people are beginning to listen to them again. You know, sort of Val Plumwood, you know, the founder of ecofeminism, that sort of young women and young, you know, that, oh, young going back and looking at her achievements. And I think that's really important. And, uh, and that's very positive. That's actually, you know, it's sort of lack of ageism, et cetera. But it's really important that those other voices um, are there that in the 1960s are now very relevant now. And that's a very exciting one. Yes. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that we're after 11 o'clock um, and I think it's important in these moments where we are all so uh, spending so much of our time online to stick to um, uh, our timings but I want to um, just put some things in the chat um, uh, to tell you about uh, our next session on Monday June the 21st. Um, these are uh, um, three guests. We're going to carry on thinking about ecology as mental and, and public health, and that touches exactly on Andrew's idea. Ecology is not that green space over there. It's the relatedness, the structures of relatedness in, in which we find ourselves. Uh, now, um, one last point from um, the guests, and that's um, Francine, who makes a point uh, about mindfulness uh, as being a, a, a biotechnology. There is, are these very simple strategies, um, breaths, mindfulness, interception, uh, and so on, um, that we can understand as ways of helping us tune into what we need for this uh, long uh, progressive change. Thank you very much to everybody who's come. Thank you very much to uh, our guests, uh, Andrew Patricio and, and Alice Shires. And thank you also to uh, Rosie. Thank you, thank you Trevor, and all the best. All the best of luck with your work. Thank Fantastic. you.